Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk Nation Radio, who funds so-called foreign relations experts and why? Our guest is Eli Clifton. He is senior advisor at the Quincy Institute and investigative journalist at large at Responsible Statecraft. He recently published an article called Weapons Biz Bankrolls Experts Pushing to Extend Afghan War. Eli Clifton, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming on. So I understand a study group established by Congress has recommended that President Joe Biden extend the May 1st deadline for getting troops out of Afghanistan. Who who made up this study group? Well, it, as you said, it was it was formed by Congress called the Afghanistan Study Group. There were 15 members, plenary members, sort of decision makers in the group. Uh, and what I found was that over two thirds of them had various business ties, financial ties to the weapons industry. Now, who these people were, were actually the type of people that you would expect to see on a blue ribbon panel. It was uh, former political appointees. It was former people who had worked in the intelligence services. It was former generals who had commanded uh, uh, US and NATO troops in Afghanistan. Uh, and I think that what this shows, and we can get into some of, some of the deeper ethical questions, but sort of one of the top line things that jumped out at me is that it's entirely possible that if you want to comprise and put together a blue ribbon panel of the types of people who, who they chose to put on this, without even uh, uh, there being anything nefarious going on, it's a high likelihood that you're going to have people who have extensive ties to the weapons business. And why that is, is probably something that, that we should be looking at closely. And, and I think it probably has something to do with the revolving door in Washington. The fact that the weapons manufacturers actually seek these people out to put them on their boards, hire them as consultants, hire them as lobbyists. Uh, but that doesn't make the, the potential conflict of interest here uh, any, any, any less glaring or any less problematic. What I found was that, uh, that just a handful of them had collected over $4 million in, in stock and cash from weapons manufacturers for their services on the board. Now that's a conflict of interest, it would seem, or a potential one, and it was never really flagged in the report as potentially an issue. Well, was any was a single person included on this study group who had been right about any recent wars? That is, who had opposed and presumably is somewhat widely recognized now as having been right in opposing starting wars on Afghanistan or Iraq or Libya or Syria or anywhere else in the world? Well, uh, in certainly in the 15 member plenary, uh, I know people jumped out at me as folks who had been highly critical of, of any of our recent wars. They've certainly been critical about the execution of it, which is sort of standard inside the Beltway as the way that you that you explain the failures that have occurred to say, well, you know, I supported the broader idea of this, but just the execution, the part I wasn't directly involved in uh, at any given point in time, that's when things really went wrong. I will say that what's interesting is that it wasn't just the, the study group itself wasn't just comprised of these 15 people. There were an additional group of expert advisors who were consulted and a number of them have tweeted, published articles. I've spoke with one of them in depth and quoted them talking about the fact that, you know, the conclusions that the study group ultimately came to didn't necessarily reflect uh, the views that were expressed by the expert advisors. The expert advisors were former, former diverse in their backgrounds didn't just come out of uh, high, high, highly uh, uh, influential and important po appointed political positions or out of the military. A lot of them had sort of deep regional experience with Afghanistan. And a lot of them were warning that, okay, you know, the study group says that the, the targets may not be met for where the, where the United States wants the, 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 the situation in Afghanistan to be on May 1st, which is currently the withdrawal deadline. Uh, and if you want to pursue an extension that 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 comes with challenges and there's no guarantee of success with that and that certainly a unilateral extension uh potentially throws the 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 the, the potential for uh, for the peace process being successful really into question because now you've sort of left the negotiated framework and, and gone into 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 an unknown space on the flip side trying to persuade the taliban to agree to an extension well 
that that also is challenging. There's no certainty that they'd agree. Uh, and a lot of attention would need to be put to, well, what would be the persuasive things that could be, what would be the incentives that could be offered to the Taliban? What's, what are the incentives uh, or coercion that could be applied to both the Taliban and to Pakistan? What would be uh, sort of a, a regional uh, approach that, that could potentially get uh, this process at the extension that, that the study group wants? Again, no guarantee of success. Uh, and, and these sort of questions about, well, it's not just as easy as saying you want to extend past May 1st, you need to look at what are the potential consequences of doing so and what would that process look like? And, and that that seemed to be missing from the study group's uh, a published report. So it doesn't seem that inevitable that you get uh, a group made up uh, primarily of weapons funded promoters of more war. You have to you have to treat having been right about anything as disqualifying and you have to ignore uh, diverse opinions, dissenting voices uh, from experts that you have found and identified just not listened to. Right. Well, I think that's true. I think it's also, as I was saying earlier, probably a reflection of what are considered sort of the the, the, the creme de la creme of, of, of the foreign policy elites in Washington. Uh, it's those people that do have that experience inside administrations, that do have that experience in the military, and those people tend not to be as critical uh, as some of the, the other outside experts. Now, that's no reason to say that a stud, the study group needs to be comprised entirely of those people. Uh, actually, what you know, people I talked to were saying is that, fine, you can include some of those folks, but maybe you should include some other people as well to get at least a diversity of perspectives in, in, in the 15 member plenary group. And that it doesn't seem like that was the case. There's no indication that there were uh, any real dissenting views. If there were, though, those people have not spoken out about it. Now, one member of this study group that you mentioned in your article, Eli Clifton, was a, a former U.S. senator. That ought to be a, an uncompromised independent voice, right? <laughs> well, one would think, and you're thinking of Kelly Ayotte, of a uh, former uh, senator from New Hampshire from 2011 to 2016. Uh, and yeah, exactly. You would think that, well, that seems like somebody who, who you know, she had an interest in foreign policy at the time. Um, when she did serve in the Senate, and that seems like somebody who would be a good person to have. Uh, but since 2016, she's actually served on the board of BAE Systems, which is the subsidiary of the UK defense giant BAE Systems PLC, um, and uh, and has you know, been receiving compensation for that. So it's uh, it, it it certainly opens one's eyes to how this process works, and and it really calls attention to the fact that you know there is a sophisticated. I would say organized revolving door where defense contractors are seeking out these types of people to get them onto their boards and to get them financially uh, invested with them. Uh, I would also want to point to, to General Dunford, uh, who also served in, in the leadership. There was a three member leadership group that Dunford and, and, and I were, were, were members of. Uh, and, and Dunford is, uh, you know, a very highly accomplished uh, individual. He was he served as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff from 2015 to 2019, uh, and he was the commander of all U.S. and NATO forces in Afghanistan in 20 in 2013. Uh, and he joined the board of Lockheed Lockheed Martin. Now, as part of his uh, compensation package, as part of his uh, incentive package on the board, he has received uh, uh, around two hundred ninety thousand dollars worth of stock. And uh, as part of the Lockheed Martin director's equity plan. Now, what's really interesting about this equity plan is that uh, Lockheed Martin actually talks about what it is. And it's a scheme they developed to, and I quote here, to further align the economic interests of board members with the interests of stockholders generally. Well, I guess that makes sense. But you have to start to say, well, okay, so Lockheed Martin is actually saying that they've aligned his economic incentives with Lockheed Martin's shareholders. Is he able to just completely divide these things when he offers his advice to the study group about what US foreign policy should be in Afghanistan? Um, is that at least something worth disclosing or talking about or saying, hey, this is a potential conflict of interest, but don't worry, I've separated my interests. Uh, and, and this is the types of conversations that, that in Washington I've noticed uh, people don't want to have. And, and this study group, uh, just to go through a couple more of the members, uh, is not just people with conflicts of interest but pe or people who have been wrong about every recent war. It's people who have been central 
to uh, promoting and and promoting on the basis of blatant lies some of the worst wars uh, in generations, including Stephen Hadley, uh, whose record on on Iraq ought to disqualify him from anything in public service, I would think. What one would think so. I mean, but then again, Hadley, just to go quickly sort of through his background, as you pointed out, you know, he played a central role in uh, in pushing the false intelligence about Iraq's pursuit of you know, alleged nuclear weapons material from Niger, uh, which was included in George W. Bush's 2003 State of the Union address. Uh, and, and, you know, that that was pretty devastating. He actually ended up offering his resignation over it, uh, which was uh, George W. Bush did not accept. Uh, but after the Bush administration and after, you know, having made mistakes that you would think would really count against one in terms of one's credibility in, in any number of different forums, including in the private sector, right? Um, you know, he joined Raytheon's board in 2010, and now he's received nearly $2.6 million in cash and stock uh, for, for, his, for his work there. So it, it really does start to, to beg the question, like, is there any notion of accountability in, in the Beltway foreign policy, uh, the so-called blob? Uh, or, or is this something that's just considered it's uncouth to talk about the fact that that trying to hold people accountable for their track records, talking about their track records and talking about the financial conflicts of interest that they may have developed over the, over the past several years? There was, I think, a glimmer of accountability when Michelle Flournoy, uh, who some of us opposed her uh, looming nomination for secretary of so-called defense, uh, and she ended up being apparently too war crazed uh, to make it into the cabinet. Uh, that looked promising, but her voice was on this on this study group too, right? That's right. And and again, just because my focus is sort of where, where does the defense contractor money come in? You know, she co-founded West Exec Advisors. Uh, and when Anthony Blinken uh, was was did, revealed his did a financial disclosure uh, when he was uh, at that point the nominee to become Biden's secretary of state, he, he revealed that West Exec indeed had Boeing as a client. Um, and I and I would also add that it wasn't just Michelle Flournoy with ties to West Exec who were involved in the Afghanistan study group. Also, Lisa Monaco uh, uh, also is a quote so-called principal at West Exec. Uh, and 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 so West Exec was was well represented. And and again, that doesn't mean that their views are completely irrelevant or shouldn't be listened to. Uh, but it is just a really noticeable trend that these people have all received money from the defense industry in one way, shape or form, or have ties to or have ties to consultancies that have done so. Also, we don't know exactly what West Exec offered in services to, for instance, Boeing. Uh, it, it's a consultancy, so that they don't lobby. So we don't really get those sorts of details. And no one's really answered those questions. All we know is that Boeing was a client and paid them money. Can I can I ask just to play devil's advocate for one second with incredible appreciation for what you're exposing here, Eli Clifton? Why do you call it a defense industry? You're not paid to call it that. These guys <laughs> are paid to call it that. Uh, the reason any of us have any questions about these wars and aren't just cheering and applauding through this whole show is that they're so blatantly not defensive, uh, counterproductive in those terms. Why, why call it, why use the language that they pay these other people big bucks to use? I, I, you make an excellent point. It's, it's the weapons industry. Let's be honest about it. Uh, they make weapons. Whether those are used for defense or offense, the point is it's a weapons industry. Uh, and, and to suggest it's something as broad as, as a defense industry, uh, which is certainly a broad idea and one that I guess you could get far, it tests probably far better in terms of public sentiments. Uh, these companies make weapons. They make missiles, they make bombs, they make, they make fighter aircraft, they make bombers. Uh, th that, in, especially in the case of companies like Lockheed and Raytheon, uh, that's their bread and butter. Uh, and yeah. and to, you're right to call it to call it the defense industry is is that's a component I suppose of the broad overarching area in which they work, but they make some very specific products. They they, they don't make an idea or a strategy. Well, it's a negligible component <laughs> if it exists in in my humble opinion. Uh, it, it, this so this makeup of a congressional study group uh, is largely consisting of people in the pay of the of the military industry, the weapons industry. Is this a problem that's getting worse, getting better, or is this the same old thing of the past, you know, 75 years or so? Uh, and in terms of, of media appearances from these so-called experts uh, who often don't disclose their their interests, is this a problem that's getting worse? worse in your view in, in recent years, or is this just steady uh, corruption we're used to? 
<clears throat> you know, I, I think it certainly follows the trend of corruption that we are used to and that we have sort of already a lot of people don't even find this surprising, don't even find it notable because it just seems normal. Uh, I do think it is growing in the amount that it's going on. And I think there's a few things that have um, uh, maybe helped it build it out more. For starters, just the amount of money floating around in the, in, in, in the weapons industry and as a result of the defense budget uh, has gone up dramatically. Uh, the NDAA was something like $740 billion, uh, uh, the most recent one, and uh, over half of that goes to defense contractors. Uh, most people don't realize that. So just the no, absolute amount of money. <laughs> sorry. To, to military contractors, you mean? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and, 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 that's, and that's growing, too, as you write about, right? The percentage of military spending that goes to private companies is, is also growing, right? That's right. And, and again, I wouldn't just look at the, uh, the percentage. I would also look at what the absolute budget is. So the percentage yeah. is growing. The absolute budget, I think, is actually growing even faster. So the absolute sums of money are quite staggering. Uh, and for companies like, like Lockheed, companies like Raytheon, uh, that 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 are the pr the primary source of their business are these contracts with 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 the U.S. government. Um, so I think the amount of money floating around has certainly gone up. Uh, but I also think the methods in which people have sort of, uh, for lack of a better term, sort of embraced the dark money world of Washington, I think has also expanded a bit. I think that you see, and, and I'm speculating a little bit here, but I I think that what what one has seen is that people have realized that. The lobbying laws um, are, are simply easy to either get around or are not enforced that heavily. Uh, and so you can give money to think tanks, you can give money, you can hire people as consultants, um, and that those types of expenditures don't have to always be disclosed. More often than not, they're not disclosed. Um, and that there's no sort of legal structure under which you have to disclose how that money is being used. Whereas if you hire a lobbyist, that actually does get disclosed. If you give a campaign contribution, in most cases that gets disclosed. If you give money to a think tank, if you hire somebody as a consultant, um, you know, you, you kind of have to dig around to find evidence that that occurred. For instance, West exec with Boeing. We only know about that because, because of Blinken's uh, confirmation. That's the only reason that we have that information. Um, and, and giving money to a think tank. Well, it's actually the think tanks get to voluntarily disclose who, who their funders are. Um, that's not something they are required to do. So we have no real uh, levers to, to guarantee that, that we get access to that information. And I think that the ways in which people have availed themselves of that, knowing that the lobbying laws are pretty easy to get around and that you could still spend money on lobbyists, but there's a lot of other ways to spend money that won't be tracked, uh, I think that's been expanded upon. And I think what we're seeing with the Afghanistan study group and, and the instances I identified is probably just the tip of the iceberg of what that world looks like. What about the campaign contributions that in some other country we might call bribes uh, are, are with the uh, with the money going to these military companies uh, skyrocketing? Is there more money going to congressional campaigns from weapons companies? Absolutely. And I mean, you, you see this in particular in states and in districts where members of Congress uh, or a candidate uh, has a has a defense contractor as one of the primary employers in that district. So when they give that money, when they give that campaign campaign contribution, uh, when it comes from their corporate PAC or from individuals who are employees of of of, of these weapons manufacturers, you, you end up seeing uh, that that it's not just a, an outright bribe; it's also just sort of a reminder that hey, you know, we employ this many people in your district. Um, all we need is for you to notice. We don't even need to we don't even need to make this like a transactional thing directly. It's that. We employ these many people. You really don't want to, to to advertise that you're taking on policies that that might limit the number of, of jobs that that we can continue to to support in your district. Now, the interesting thing is that this is a really costly way of if you're just looking at it as a job creation tool. And there's been some good studies on this. It's a very ineffective way of, of creating jobs is to do it through defense contractors. Uh, and very often, in a very weird way, we hear about um, you know so-called defense contractors, weapons manufacturers being uh, a source of, it, it's a good thing because all of these, they, they create jobs. You know, the F-35 is, has components made in pretty much every state. Now that's probably not the most efficient way to make, to make an airplane. I mean, I'm not an engineer, not an expert on this. 
but probably you would want to centralize some of that if you were really going to try to make this in an efficient manner. But they make something in pretty much every state and in, in a lot of congressional districts. And they do that intentionally. It's so they can have this uh, message they can deliver to members of Congress, which is that look how many jobs are created through this program. And it's not untrue, jobs are created, but you're doing so through uh, mostly uh, uh, public companies who are trying to create value for their shareholders. It's not their first priority to create these jobs. Uh, and it's a costly way of doing so. But Eli, in a sense, it is untrue, right? If the studies from University of Massachusetts Amherst, for example, are correct, that you would have more jobs, not just if the money went into education or infrastructure. That's or exactly energy, true. But even if you never taxed the money from working people mm -hmm. in the first place, you yep. never touched that money, you would have more jobs. Then it's, it's certainly true that there are people who have military jobs and those mm -hmm. are real people and they really exist. But it's not true that military spending creates jobs. It reduces jobs. Right? At, in the absolute sense, at, yes, it does. You're right. It, it, the, the money, if you, see, if you just didn't, if you just reduce taxes on the amount uh, that, that, that's required to actually support that, that industry, yes, you would actually create more jobs. You would also uh, inject more money into the economy and, and it would be a great stimulus. And we talk about stimulus yeah. spending all the time. Um, and, and we don't talk about that as being a potential stimulus of what if we just reduce those taxes, uh, left that money in working people's pockets, let them spend it, which they do, uh, that would also create jobs that would also that would also create demand for products and for jobs. Uh, we don't talk about that. Instead, it's this it's this absolute focus on, well, here are the jobs that indeed are, you know, OK, you give half of the defense budget to weapons manufacturers. And that in turn uh, supports X number of jobs, but we're not looking at it in that holistic manner you just pointed out, which is that, right, but that was a trade-off, wasn't it? That we had to tax people uh, a certain amount of money to, co to collect that $740 billion. And that money could have gone a lot of different places. We could have continued to tax them and spent it in a different manner, or we could have just not taxed them uh, and let them keep the money and spend it however they want. Uh, and that that also would have had economic impacts. And you're pointing exactly to, to those studies that have shown that the overall impact may have actually been more jobs <laughs> and, right. and, 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 and actually an, an improved economic situation. There, there's another good article you uh, wrote at Responsible Statecraft related to this topic. The headline was tax burden from the Pentagon budget authorized by the NDAA wipes out COVID stimulus payments. What did you mean by that? <laughs> well, what, what I was looking at, and, uh, and this was really interesting, you know, just sort of doing some basic basic arithmetic, but but looking at the, the NDAA, which was $740 billion, and I was comparing it, and this was, what was it, back uh, last year in, in the summer, to the, uh, to the COVID-19 stimulus checks that were being sent out. And I, and I looked at it and said, all right, well, um, you know, what does this really mean in terms of the, we, the, the defense budget versus the stimulus payment? Uh, and what I found is, well, OK, so like the IRS was anticipating that uh, the average tax filer was going to be uh, uh, paying like four thousand seven hundred something dollars in taxes um, and that that actually completely was wiping out the stimulus payment. Uh, and on top of that, imposing an additional two thousand nine hundred something dollars uh, on each filer. Um, so just the portion of the and, and just the portion of the NDAA that was going to these weapons manufacturers um, was uh, imposing a two thousand four hundred dollars or so uh, uh, in, in, in cost on each tax filer. Um, and, and these are like these are real numbers and people don't talk about it. We always talk about these big numbers. No one knows what three hundred and seventy billion dollars looks like. No one looks knows what seven hundred and forty billion dollars looks like. People know what like two thousand four hundred dollars looks like. Um, and that's the th that was how much like each tax filer on average uh, was paying uh, for or will pay for the NDAA. Uh, and, and it's interesting because then when you well, OK, fine. So there was the stimulus payment of the uh, of the, the of the first COVID checks that came out. Uh, and even with that, uh, it's just again, what if we just subtract that from the amount that people were paying for the NDAA? They still were out of pocket nearly 600 bucks. Um, and, and this is where we get back to what you were, I think, pointing out earlier, that we're talking about some real costs for individual taxpayers. Uh, that money can go to other places. We don't have to be putting it there. Um, and when we talk even about a stimulus that was so controversial, uh, the first round of COVID checks, 
it actually pales in comparison to, what, to what's being spent uh, on, on, on the NDAA and what goes to weapons manufacturers. Uh, yet we don't talk about that trade-off. And these are real economic trade-offs that are being made. And it's happening. Uh, it's happening in real time. I know that if you look at per capita military spending, every man, woman, and child in the United States, uh, it's over $2,000. The U.S. You know, is number one in the world right. uh, in this measurement. But I think you're right to look at the amount per tax filer, not, a, not every exactly. child pays taxes, right? And it's, it's exactly. twice that. It's 4000 uh right? Yeah, and, and yeah, that's what I was. That's why I chose to look at it that way. Okay, you know, I, I get it. The the why don't we just divide it by the population? But you know, in fairness, that's not how taxes are paid. Um, so let's talk about people that actually have to file taxes. When I say per tax filer, that means that somebody who files a tax return and has to pay some taxes, um, and that significantly reduces the number. And as you're right, that roughly doubles it, uh, the amount per taxpayer essentially. Yeah. Um... You know, you've written some great articles about about Congress. We'll put all the links up at at talkworldradio.org. But I want I I watched a hearing recently uh, with Neera Tandon in the Budget Committee with Chairman Bernie Sanders, and it was remarkable to me, if to not many other people, that he asked her about corporate funding of her think tank, Center for American Progress. Uh, and then all the Republican senators, or most of them, when they came their turn, said, no, I don't mind the corporate funding. That's wonderful. I'm proud of you for getting that corporate funding. But Bernie had never, didn't mention funding from the royal dictatorship of the United Arab Emirates. Uh, and it's hard for me to think the Republicans' responses would have been identical had he. Why don't why don't Congress members mention funding from foreign dictatorship, oil provider, weapons customers? Uh, why why doesn't that ever come up? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. One is that that money is so prevalent. Uh, you know, one of the Republicans, something that doesn't even get talked about is one of the Republican Party's top fundraisers uh, is a former congressman from Minnesota. His name is Norm Coleman. Uh, and Norm Coleman. Uh, wears a couple of hats and, and they're pretty interesting hats. One is that he's uh, been on the board of, he's been the chair, I don't know if he still is the chair of the Republican Jewish uh, Coalition, which uh, is, is sort of the entity that, that encompassed uh, Sheldon and Miriam Adelson. Sheldon Adelson is recently deceased, but they were some two of the biggest funders of the Republican party and, and very close also with Benjamin Netanyahu and the Likud party in Israel. So that's one role that Coleman plays. And, and he had been the person who traditionally made the ask of Adelson, uh, when it came to uh, uh, every every two years, when the Republican Party went to him and said, "We need, you know, a hundred million dollars, whatever it was, uh, yeah. to, to to sort of to 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 spend on individual congressional races," uh, and he was uh, so he so he played that role. But Coleman has another hat, which is that he's also a lobbyist for Saudi Arabia. <laughs> And so the Republican Party's biggest fundraiser is a lobbyist for Saudi Arabia. And, and I think that uh, he actually got asked about this once. Uh, it was after the Khashoggi murder. Uh, and he was asked, uh, this is very interesting. He was asked, because it, it was a softball question by, I think it was a Minnesota television station. And they said, well, you know. 30 seconds what? left, Eli. Oh, sorry. Yeah, they said, well, what do you tell your clients? Uh, what, what, what do you tell your the, the Saudis about, you know, you must give them advice like, hey, you know, knock some of this off, you know, really softball stuff. And he said, oh, no, that's not my role. My job is to tell Congress like what they think, what Saudi Arabia thinks. He's like, that's the <laughs> way this Saudi communication works. Him. Congress isn't paying him, right? Yeah. He's like, so I think that, you know, that's just one example of why this is so pervasive. It's it's not just the Republicans. Uh, both of the parties do this. Uh, but the point is, is that Saudi and Emirati funding is everywhere. It's in the think tank space. It's in uh, even loosely connected to the campaign finance space, which is, I think, what that showed. Uh, incredible and discouraging answer, but very much appreciated. Nonetheless, we've been speaking with Eli Clifton. He's a senior advisor at the Quincy Institute and investigative journalist at large at Responsible Statecraft. Uh, Eli Clifton, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks for having me, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. 
Help End War at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.